Foreign Secretary Ernest Bevin summed up the government's situation when he declared in Cabinet, we are in Shylock's hands. Shylock's a rather personal way of putting it, but the American did uh, turn the screws on us. And the Americans used the knowledge of our bankruptcy to try and force upon the government policies that many people in the government had doubts about. Ernie Bevin was the heavyweight member of that government. So when Ernie said, firstly, how dreadful it was, secondly, how reality meant you had to accept it, he actually used the phrase, we are in the hands of Shylock. But what he meant was, means we have to do what Shylock demands. So if American money had not been available and we had decided to reject their conditions, what was already difficult would have become catastrophic. Without the essential help we got from the United States, we wouldn't have been able to introduce the welfare state. We wouldn't have been able to have full employment. Uh, and you would have had a colossal increase in the cost of living because our balance of payments would collapse. The fact is, without it, we couldn't have, uh, we couldn't have kept the country going at all. Britain was at a turning point in its history and had set a course it had no prospect of reaching. The welfare state and the maintenance of a costly empire overseas didn't come cheap. The cabinet were faced with a classic catch-22 when discussing the question of accepting America's, or Shylock's, loan terms. I mean, how serious was this cabinet crisis? Were people about to resign? Well, they did have a monumental cabinet row. They were going to have a national health service, they were going to have a welfare state, they were going to have a proof state education system. All great things which you and I could uh, now take for granted. The, the economic truth was that none of that could be afforded in 1945. But that's what the government's platform was. Yet I suppose there was a huge irony in the fact that the New Jerusalem, with all its great ambitions would not have been realized without American money. Oh yes, that's true, but that's because we spent so much saving the Western civilization when we were on our own before the Americans came into the war. On December the 5th, 1945, the cabinet reluctantly approved the best deal Keynes could prize from the US negotiators. Three and three quarter billion dollars at two percent, with plenty of unwelcome small print as well. This was no free grant. Lords Keynes and Halifax, and Secretaries Burns and Vincent at the signing of the multi billion dollar American loan to Great Britain. Three and a quarter billion dollars is a lot of money. It is not a gift or a grant. It is a loan with interest. In addition to repayment, the United States receives benefits in the revision of trade policies, which will enable us to do business with all nations. I couldn't sleep a wink last night. Because we had that silly fight I thought my heart would break The whole night through Keynes's heart was so fragile There was no possibility of his flying home As soon as his boat docked in Southampton He headed straight for Westminster And to the House of Lords where a debate was raging over his agreement. Keynes wearily told his fellow peers, I shall never, so long as I live, cease to regret that this is not an interest-free loan. Well, Keynes could have his regrets, but there was no alternative but to sell the deal to the House of Lords. Kevin, just, just look at these headlines from... Mm. 1945. Here's the Daily Mail, mm. broadsheet in those days. Mm. House grim and confused over US loan issue. We look at this, mm. then we look at Black Wednesday or Dennis Healy going to the IMF. 
Where does this rate on the Richter scale of economic crisis for Britain? Oh, on the Richter scale, this is a 10. Bigger than Black Wednesday, bigger than Dennis Healy and the IMF. This was the financial rug being pulled under a Labour government with all its great plans for post-war reconstruction, all the houses, all the jobs, and all of a sudden, the financial funds are cut off. Grim and confused, that must have been the least of it. I mean, how would you react as a journalist, or even as a citizen, what would your reaction be? You'd be astonished, and you'd think, this is just the most amazing story. Your big wartime ally, the country you fought together against Germany, defeated Nazi Germany, has already cut off the funds. Absolutely astonishing. The outrage would be amazing, and there'd be a huge anti-American sentiment. The dictation by dollar, a uh, not respectful way to treat Britain, mm. And here's this look. There is no justification for this cringing policy of appeasement. Some fantastic mm. pieces of oratory here. Mm. This was the economic Munich. But there was one mandate the government never got from the people of this country, and that was to sell the British Empire for a packet of cigarettes. He brings it down to something people can understand, uh, a packet of cigarettes. It's just, it's great oratory. What headline would you put on this story? Oh, I think now we'd be more direct and we'd say Britain betrayed or US betrays Britain. I think there'd be no question that was the feeling at the time, that was the popular feeling. And indeed, I think there's a good case to be made. That's what happened. Someone's rocking my dream boat. Someone's invading my dream. We were sailing along, peaceful and calm. Suddenly something went wrong. Betrayed or not, we needed the money fast. By the end of the year, Parliament had reluctantly agreed to the loan. But in Washington, it began to look as if Congress would reject the deal and that we wouldn't get so much as one cent. Foreigners coming to Washington commonly underestimate the power of Congress. They do well to spend much more time here on the Hill. The loan was having a disastrous press back home. Ironically, it was no more popular here, where they held the purse strings. One congressman could barely contain himself. Anglo-American relations will be poisoned again. The charge of Uncle Shylock will be repeated annually. Britain's rotten imperialism has revolted decent men and women. This loan will be used to support British imperialism abroad. When it comes to trading, Britain is as covetous as a sponge, sucking in all she can, but not giving up anything unless squeezed. We have a bit of a problem. You have a Congress, many of whom are proud not to own passports. There are some Luddites in the House who are afraid that this relationship with Great Britain will compel us to give away national secrets and all. Uh, if you were a Republican isolationist, then simply the fact that a foreign government in, the, in peacetime was now asking for money was enough. If you were a traditional Republican conservative, the idea that it was a socialist government, new government in Britain, and that the wartime ally of Churchill had been thrown out, that might have been enough. There was also a sort of an element of progressive isolationism led by a Democrat who viewed this as almost in terms of economic warfare. Something needed to be done, otherwise the loan would never get through Congress. In January 1946, just as the loan was dying a slow death up on Capitol Hill, a very special visitor arrived in America. Winston Churchill was one Englishman Americans always seemed glad to see. Officially, he was on holiday. But behind the scenes, Churchill telephoned, wined and dined America's top political power brokers and pleaded Britain's case. There are fears of British socialism here. But I must point out that most of the leaders of Britain's present government were members of my wartime coalition government with experience and understanding and are certainly not rash doctrinaire socialists liable to go to extremes. Well, Churchill had enormous credibility, particularly with the Republicans. And this was vital to selling the program. I mean, remember, America, particularly even in 45, the idea of a 
socialist government, uh, it, you know, is just simply beyond the understanding of, a, of an ordinary American. And an ordinary American politician would look at it with fear. And yet Churchill was able to say, this is a broad patriotic government, people with whom I've worked, people with whom I have confidence, and merely his blessing of this, to say Britain will be Britain even after the Labor government. And the Labor government deserves your financial support and will use it wisely. And the Labor government will be a, and is and will continue to be a close ally of the United States. We're reassuring words. But one small speech was to cause a big commotion. It was, of course, a very big day in the history of Fulton, Missouri, when President Truman and Winston Churchill paid their visit. The speech began well enough, as Churchill hailed a unique friendship with a memorable expression he had coined himself. This means a special relationship between the British Commonwealth and Empire and the United States of America. And what Churchill said next was far less welcome. From Stettin in the Baltic to Trieste in the Adriatic, an iron curtain has descended across the continent. White House advisor and historian Jeff Schessel wrote speeches for President Clinton. At the time, the words seem perhaps confrontational, perhaps unduly stark and does not go down well with the public that is war-weary at this point and worried that Churchill or Britain are going to drag the United States into a conflict with the Soviet Union that is not inevitable. The speech went down so badly that opposition in Congress to the loan actually strengthened. Even Churchill's host, President Truman, felt it politic to distance himself from the scaremongering Brit. Why would he do that? Truman, like many others uh, around him, and like Churchill himself, uh, was stunned by the reaction against the speech that followed it immediately. There was a fierce condemnation of the speech in, in the American press, and in the American Congress, on a number of, of different levels. And Truman was so startled by this that he began to, to scurry away from it and suggest that he knew nothing of it and, and could not possibly stand by it. This was a very dark and uncertain moment of his presidency. Don't blame me for falling in love with you. I'm under your spell, but how can I help it? Don't blame me. Throughout the spring of 1946, President Truman and America agonized over the post-war world. Who were their allies and who their enemies? What was their policy to be about wartime ally, Uncle Joe Stalin's Soviet Union? In the face of the communist threat, American public opinion softened markedly towards socialist Britain's plight. The remaining opposition to the loan began to fall away. The Anglo-American Loan Agreement was eventually ratified on the 15th of July, 1946. So what had changed? Well, the Cold War had begun. It took almost a year, but the Americans eventually decided that Stalin's Russia was the real threat. Commercial rivalry took a back seat as Britain's value as a bulwark against the spread of communism came to the fore. Alongside this, Atlas socialism, a little nationalization here, a touch of the welfare state there, was a minor matter. Justice, it wasn't. But I'd happily take a mortgage at 2% over 50 years. The peril lay with the strings the Americans attached to the deal. One key condition was that Britain signed up to the Bretton Woods Agreement, giving birth to the IMF and the World Bank. John Maynard Keynes had been passionately committed to designing a global financial system that would help prevent economic crisis 
and the terrible conflicts it spawned. The fledgling IMF and World Bank owed much to him. Keynes wanted the IMF permanently